lecturer is uh, once again uh, Dimitri Saltis from uh, EPFL uh, Switzerland and uh, uh, actually is uh, the talk of his uh, present uh, the title of his presentation is uh, the one that was uh, planned uh, for yesterday that is uh, machine learning for imaging in complex optical media okay. welcome Dimitri Oh, thank you. Happy to see you again. Okay. Yes, I, I share my screen, right? Yes, right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, here it is. Now I have to skip the Laris. Okay, so good to see you again. Uh, yeah, so uh, for some reason, I changed the order. So. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about using machine learning for imaging in complex optical media. And uh, uh, this is the outline. I'll tell you about some old work that we did in uh, using uh, using Holox to build neural networks. And then I'll talk about the recent resurgence, which, you know, I talked about yesterday a little bit as well, about my own work in this area. And then I'll discuss more uh, about... Uh, work that kind of is dominating the current area on of combining neural networks and optics somehow which is really using neural networks in the context of optics but not implementing neural networks with optics uh, so you, you use uh, the neural networks to help the imaging uh, the imaging not okay so this group we all know a single neuron is you have uh, inputs to a neuron so denote by x, a vector x, and they are weighted. So this is the memory of the system or the part that gets trained. And then you have some sort of decision layer, some uh, nonlinear function. It could be a sharp threshold like this or something softer. So some time ago, long time ago, in 1985, uh, we built the first optical network of this type uh, when I was still back at Caltech. And uh, the, it was a very simple network. It was built using an array of LEDs. Uh, there were a total of, uh, of 64 or 32 neurons, really. Uh, then, uh, then you can think of each neuron, and then the light would be detected by a detector here. We had an array of the uh, photodiodes, uh, also 32. So if you think of this as an input to the neuron, so this would be this axis. And then the weights would be represented by one row of this mask. So right from an LED would be mapped to, uh, would be imaged onto the array. So it would be a weight. Then the light from each row would be integrated on a single detector. So that that does the, the neuron. And the threshold would be done electronically in the feedback loop. And then we could have an array of neurons by having multiple rows on this mask. And this was uh, this was the what the system looked like at the time. And this could be controlled by this uh, box. By setting up the switches, you could initi initiate the, uh, the machine by setting the LED displays here in the system to a certain value. This would give you a response. Each neuron would, uh, would, uh, would, get a, uh, would decide whether to be on or off. And then this is a Hopfield network, which means the, the signal will be fed back to the input for the next iteration. So uh, so once you set it up manually like this, then you would flip the switch, clock, and then these LEDs would flicker both on the display here and on the optical system itself, and then the system would lock into, uh, into a state, and, that, that, and that's the operation. So it's a form of icing machine. Now, nowadays, this is referred to more like an icing machine or does optimizations and so forth. At the time, this was very exciting in 1985. Uh, even electronically, you couldn't do this very, very easily. But eventually, a colleague of mine started building analog VLSI chips to do the same thing on a single chip. So, so in order to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to see how optics can be competitive at that time, I moved on to using holograms to do the interconnection rather than these two-dimensional masks, specifically volume holograms. So we built a neural network system, we built several things, but one of them was, I think, the most advanced thing we built at that time, uh, was a system to do face recognition. At that time, face recognition was not like it is now, where you have 
you know, we have it on, a, on your cell phone, a face recognition system, it would be uh, very, very difficult to do on, on, any, on any kind of digital machine. But the, building, the system we built uh, had an input image on an SLM that uh, has a million pixels. Then the system would have about a thousand hidden units. I'll show it to you. We wrote a video rates. So it could, uh, it could uh, do three times 10 to the 10 synapses per second, the operations it would do. The block diagram was like that. There was a TV camera looking at the video. So the person would uh, move around so that uh, you could have different presentations of the person's face. Then it would be recorded on a VCR. I wonder how many of you know what a VCR is. It stands for a video cassette recorder. It's, it was a way to ma on magnetic tape to record video. This has been a long time uh, uh, replaced. So for the training, you would record this video and then you would use this video to train the system. And the training would be done in this optical first layer on a photorefractive crystal or an optical crystal where it would accumulate holograms. And then, and then uh, once the training was done, the video would directly be fed to the input special light modulator and then you would get the classification. This is more what the optical system looked like. This was published in 93, but the work was done mostly around 1990. So liquid crystal SLM, uh, the hologram here, an array of detectors here, but a thousand detectors. Then the output would be either optically or electronically integrated to a single output. And so it would simulate a network like this. A thousand input, a million input units, a thousand hidden units, and then one single output unit. So, uh, there is also pretty, you know, again, keep in mind it's 85. So what you see here is, this is Yong Chao, one of the people that built this network at the time. Uh, so uh, when this LED turns on, the system recognizes him as being Yong Chao. And this is uh, uh, Sidney Lee, his partner that they all built together, doesn't recognize it. And then uh, this is a visitor at that time from Japan, who I don't remember his name, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, he was convinced that this thing could not work. Uh, it was, was somehow, so he was suspicious of what we were doing there. And he tried hard to, uh, uh, to fool it, but he'll get, he'll get uh, uh, discouraged as well. But then, with Young, the person that is supposed to recognize, step in, uh, then he uh, he would see. I forgot to point out that what you see here at the edge. Here, the the thing on the right is the response of the hidden layer, the thousand uh, the thousand detector array uh, that uh, the response of the hidden layer. So it's uh, if you. If you look there, you see as he moves around, the different units turn on, and then they get integrated. Okay, so uh, this was again, uh, early 90s. And after that, uh, interest in optical implementations of neural networks went, uh, you know, became, uh, became somehow uh, was lost, the interest was lost, and then, uh, and then somehow we moved on to other things in my own lab. And then, uh, but in general, uh, all over the, the world, people stopped working in this area. Uh, but primarily because there was so much in, the interest in neural networks in general became less, less intense. And then uh, uh, whatever interest there was, was mostly in software or uh, at that time we didn't have uh, uh, GPUs, graphic card units, what we use now even you know on laptops or or maybe some custom hardware digital hardware and gradually neural networks came back and then supercomputers now are implementing the, the neural networks but this this was uh, this was the transition so now all of a sudden optics for the purposes of the implementation of neural networks is a hot topic again and as i talked about yesterday i'm also i'm also participating in this resurgence uh, using the multi-mode fiber as a computing element. Uh, so uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of this recent, uh, recent uh, activity is based on using 
silicon chips somehow or silicon photonics chips to, to implement the, the linear part of a neural network. I talked about this yesterday. But in this talk, I, I go through why, why, uh, why looking back at our own activity, why did we start it and why did we stop? Why didn't we continue? How come right now it's a hot topic and we, we somehow had not continued it? The reason we started is because optical interconnections are advantageous. And this is the same motivation now for the resurgence. In other words, to implement the optical the interconnections or the linear part of a neural network optically, there's solid reasons to, uh, to believe that uh, this can be advantageous, at least at a large scale. The reason is because electrical connections between two points cost energy because you have to charge and discharge the the wire where optically you just send the photons through and they arrive at the detector and you just have to have enough photons that you the detector can 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 register the, the signal so this is this is the, the same reason that we started back then the same reason this the system seems to be coming back or the idea of optical implementation of neural networks seems to be coming back so why did we stop why did we were not able to continue at that time, it was clear that optics would be competitive only for very large network, like for using 30 net, you know, 32 neurons, or using um, even, you know, even the optical uh, face recognition network. Uh, it wasn't large enough for optics to be competitive. Uh, the nonlinearity that needs to be done was immature, which means uh, uh, it's uh, this. Which means you had to implement, then detect, then do the nonlinearity uh, uh, electronically, which is what we did then, and what most of the people that are working in the field now are doing again. So this is something to think about: that if you have to go in and out of the optics, you go into the optics to do the linear transformation, then you go back to the silicon to do the digital stuff, and then back again. Uh, we have to to make sure that this is this is okay. And what we were doing there, we we're using 3D for optical storage, which I still think is a very good idea because it gives you an advantage, something you can do optically, not so easy to do electronically or otherwise. Uh, but that became too complicated to control. So now again, I mean, our own approach again is, I talked about it yesterday, is to combine kind of the three-dimensional aspect of the, of the optics in an optical fiber and the nonlinearity also in the fiber and the connectivity. So may, maybe, I mean, somehow we'll continue working in that. But some of the other approaches are also extremely interesting. So it's, it's good to see the resurgence. The rest of the talk, I'll switch gears and I'll talk about not implementing neural networks using uh, optics, but implementing optics with the help of neural networks. So the general uh, idea is like this, that you have some sort of optical system with an incident field, possibly with a spatial light modulator, some measurement system, possibly with a CCD, and some optical system in between. And this is this idea of computational imaging. So let's say if you're doing imaging and you'd like to have G be an image of F, a replica of F, if you have a lens or a nice optical microscope that, or telescope or whatever that gives you a beautiful image, well, nothing to do. But if the situation is more complicated, more, uh, more uh, uh, bizarre, then you need to somehow, from the measurement G, infer what the input F was. And that's where this machine learning comes into it because you're trying to invert the system and using the examples, a training set to do it rather than try to uh, do some inverse scattering or uh, deterministic inversion process is, is the approach. I'll show you the first example I'll show you of that is uh, imaging with multimode fibers. So, well, if you saw my talk yesterday, you know, we, we use multimode fibers for computing, but we also use them for imaging. So if you have a multimode fiber, you take a laser beam and produce a Gaussian beam that focuses on one end of it. The light gets coupled into multiple spatial modes. And normally those things, those modes uh, 
uh, propagate at different velocities. So by the time they reach the other end, they're out of phase with one another. And when you look at them, they interfere in a way that looks random. You get a speckle pattern as opposed to a single mode fiber, which only a single mode can be supported. So you start with a Gaussian like beam here, you end up with a Gaussian like beam there. So you can do com for communications. This is very advantageous because you can modulate in time and you don't have to worry about the spatial distribution. However, for imaging, this is not very useful because you cannot put information, you can only put information in the time domain. So if you want to put information in the spatial domain, having the uh, multiple modes is, is helpful. And typically we can support tens of thousands of modes, hundreds of thousands of modes, so a lot of modes can be supported. So this is what it looks like if, you, if the input is a little simple dot like this and we'll propagate along a uh, step index fiber, a fiber where the index in the middle is different than the, is, bi is bigger than the image in the surrounding. After 10 microns only, it looks okay. But after a millimeter, uh, 100 microns, uh, it already looks, uh, uh, the, the spot has, has diffused to, to a bigger uh, spot and so forth until if we go uh, uh, a tenth of a meter, then it looks like a speckle pattern. And the same thing for EPFL down here. If we start with EPFL and propagate uh, at the end of the fiber, you end up with a speckle pattern that looks like another speckle pattern. You have no, no hint what the input was. So what we would like to do now is build a system where from this pattern at the output, I reproduce what the input was. Was it the PFL logo or was it the single dot? So since this mapping from input to output is deterministic, is uh, uh, oh, so I was looking at the chart. Since it's deterministic, then uh, the uh, uh, there's a hope to invert this. So there is a there is a, there's been a lot of work, but it's not, we're not the first to look at uh, multimode fibers for optical imaging. Actually, the earliest work goes all the way back to 1967, uh, and it was done by Eric Spitz and his collaborator. Eric Spitz uh, worked in France for many years. I think he's, I think he's retired now, but he's still, he's still around. Uh, and he is one of the first early inventors of uh, optical memory disks. So he's been around for a long time. The Yariv did uh, work in the 76. And more recently, one of your compatriots, Leonardo and Bianchi, his student, uh, did the, one of the very first papers, 2011, hologram transmissions through multimode fibers. So it's kind of, this kick-started the, the, I mean, the, 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 the other works were all kind of parallel, Sismar, and Dolakia in uh, in Scotland, ourselves in uh, here in Lausanne, uh, Choi and uh, uh, Chong Choi in, uh, uh, in now in Korea, etc. There's a bit, there's been a lot of work. And if you look, this is in 2018. I, I stopped it there, but you know there was publications in multiple fiber imaging. Now it's become a topic of significant interest. So how do we do it? How do you, first of all, why do we do it? The reason you'd like to do it, a multimode fiber looks like this. This is a picture of a multimode fiber. And this is a picture of a microscope objective. And these two are pictures of uh, neurons. These are individual neurons. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, this here is, this uh, bar is, uh, I think three microns, three or five microns, I forget. But the resolution that we have in this image is one micron and approximately the same in this one. So this image on the right was obtained with this thin multimode fiber. And this image on the left was obtained with a normal objective. And for endoscopic applications, for example, you know, nobody would like to have this objective inserted into their body, but this is almost like a needle you can imagine inserting it into different parts of the body to see, to look at cells inside. So that's the motivation. Uh, so how do we interpret those images? I've done it a number of different ways. The, the way I'll describe today is using multimode fibers, uh, more than, uh, using uh, neural networks. So you present an image, be it a cell or a, something on an SLM, 
uh, use a lens to demagnify it so it goes onto the entrance surface of the multi-mode fiber. Its dimensions are typically about 100 to 200 microns diameter or across. Then uh, that image then is coupled to the different modes of the fiber. They propagate, they get out of phase, and then by the time they reach here, they look like, like this, they look like nothing. So the goal now is to use one of these neural networks to look at this image and tell you what and reconstruct or identify what the input was, either reconstruction or classification. So just uh, for neural networks, we use this uh, uh, multi deep neural networks, layers of uh, convolutional uh, kernels, which means there is a kernel here or a, a inner product uh, 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 kernel, which then looks looks for everyone in the input image for the same for the same feature. So there's a video here to try to explain this. Ah, codex unavailable. Sorry, the video won't play, so let me skip. But anyway, we use this deep neural networks to try to to interpret. So uh, then. Uh, uh, and you know you've been you've been he hearing about neural networks, so hopefully you, you you have a good idea what what I'm talking about here. So first we try to do this uh, by transmitting hundred images of hundred and digits across across the uh, uh, across the fiber. In other words, you put we write on an SLM at the input uh, digits of this type. And there's a huge database with many examples of each, of each of the digits. And then we observe at the output the corresponding speckle pattern. And then the, the network is trained to recognize from the speckle pattern back, uh, or not re recognize or reproduce the input. So if you put two zeros, you know, you get the outputs that look practically identical to the, to the uh, naked eye. But if you numerically subtract those two, these are the, the patterns obtained due to these two zeros. There is a difference. And if you take a zero in the four, you know, the output looks, you know, very slightly different, but numerically the difference is there. So hopefully you can build a network that can pick up this difference and then identify or reconstruct the four. So first we did part of classification, you know, so we build a network where uh, it will take the output of the fiber, which is this pattern, put it to the input of the network, and again, this is digital, and then we'll go through these multiple layers of processing, and then uh, typically you go to, down to fewer and fewer features, and then eventually the output layer has just 10 neurons, and the idea is that if the input is a zero, the top one should uh, light up, if the input is a fourth, the fourth unit should light up, and, and that's it. So here's some of the results. This is the image in the computer of a nine. Uh, this is what actually was on the input of the uh, SLM, or actually what would be at the input of the fiber itself, because the SLM is a phase-only device. We use phase modulation, so you can barely see the edges of the nine as it's written as a phase image. Uh, but it doesn't matter because they, in the fiber, the coupling into the modes recognizes the phase and the speckle pattern that's generated is sensitive to this phase, actually more, more, to, more to the phase than if it were an amplitude. We've tried it also with amplitude, by the way. The phase works better. And uh, in this case, we did classification. The task of the network was from this input images to tell you it's what, what it is. It's a, one, a zero, a one, a two, et cetera. So 92.5% of the time for a test image, in other words, for images that they had not seen before, it recognized them correctly. Uh, one interesting thing is that, you know, you look at the image, all kinds of uh, artifact from, uh, from coherent, from random uh, interference path, from the, you know, coherent artifacts, we call them, you know, interference patterns. Uh, but this doesn't matter really because this is incorporated into the learning algorithm. In other words, the system learns to recognize these patterns and 
and then the labels are associated with this patterns, with the clean patterns. So any distortions that happen in the optical system are somehow taken care of. So this is the confusion matrix. So you can see along the diagonal is the correct, is in the 90s, every digit was recognized. So this is similar to the performance you get if you work directly on a computer with the raw images, with the images on the computer. So basically the neural network that we use has corrected all the damage that was done by, first of all, going from the computer to the SLM, etc., and then going through the fiber and getting the severe distortion. We did the same thing for reconstruction. What I showed you before was recognition. In other words, the, the network was asked to recognize whether it was what was the digit. Now it's a little more challenging task to recognize, to reconstruct the object. So again, we have uh, a fiber propagates different lengths of fiber all the way up to a kilometer. And from the speckle image on the other side, we fit it to a network. We train the network again with many examples. And then the task is to regenerate the input. So these are some examples. This is the SLM input. And more accurately, this is what was in the computer that would go in the SLM input. And for a, for a fiber that's a tenth of a meter long, 10 centimeters long, you get very nice reconstructions. If you increase this to 10 meters, you also get nice reconstructions. The accuracy is down here numerically. Again, this is as good as you can, very close to as good as you can get anyway. Now, if you do it to a, a kilometer fiber, which is quite long, you start getting some distortion. Because you may say, okay, it's a kilometer, so we have numerically also a looser performance, close to 90%. Say so why uh, the interesting question is why do we get any distortion? In other words, what is the difference uh, for a longer fiber? And the answer to that is is here on the left, this movie on the left, which is the speckle pattern that you get for a kilometer fi fi uh, long fiber when the same image was presented on the SLM, one of the digits, I forget which one. But this shouldn't change then, right? It should be just the same digit, the same output, but it does change. And it changes for a variety of reasons. Uh, wavelength drift of the laser, if the wavelength changes, the speckle pattern changes. If uh, the fiber moves a bit, which it shouldn't, the temperature changes, things of that nature. I would say this is mostly due to uh, laser wavelength drift. So because this drifts and because during the training, it was some of these patterns were recorded at one state and during the test later on, when we reconstruct these images on the, the end, the speckle pattern changes. And the result is the reconstruction is a little bit inaccurate. Uh, so there's good news, bad news here. One's the stability of the fiber, but the good news is the training has absorbed some of this, some of this uh, variations. Uh, okay, this, we did uh, we did one more thing. Since we uh, since we're doing much better with reconstruction of kilometer fiber, one idea is you take the input fiber, you take the speckle pattern, you first recognize it, and then you classify it. So this is uh, if uh, uh, in uh, in terms of. Uh, classifying or recognizing the, which digit was it the input, the performance by itself goes down. But uh, uh, if you first reconstruct them with a network and then classify them, you get, you get better, much better performance. So uh, in other words, instead of working with uh, the, we're classifying, first we do this, we reconstruct, and then we classify these images. So already they look very good, so the classification improves. You start the speckle pattern. From the speckle pattern, you reconstruct the digit, and then you classify this digit with a second network. And the performance uh, can improve. Okay, so another thing we, uh, uh, we applied neural networks to, in, again, in fibers, is related to the topic I talked to you about yesterday, which is nonlinear propagation in multimode fibers. So what we would like to do is, is control, the, in this case, the spectrum 
of the fiber after propagating for a certain distance. In a nonlinear fiber, if you put short intense pulses, you end up generating new wavelengths because the mixing of this two of the various frequencies in the modes of the fiber uh, gives you the sum and difference or for three wave mixing it gives you the different components of the fiber eventually you can get white light continuum you can get whole white light spectrum coming out of the fiber but in this case we're interested to see if we could uh, if we would somehow control by the spatial distribution of the input what the spectrum would be at the output. So it would have like a tunable spectral shape uh, light, uh, light source, if we could do it well. So here is an example of uh, if we can combine a number of modes. So we first have one kind of reference mode or background mode, if you win, the LG40. And then we, uh, uh, we have a linear combination of uh, up to 10 other modes, I don't know how many we have here. And then by changing this combination of the modes that are launched into the, into the fiber, we get different spectra. This is simulation down here in the bottom. So what you see here is the distance away from the entrance, uh, from the, the entrances at the bottom. So distance zero going all the way to the top, that's in, in meters. So after a meter of a fiber, then we have a, uh, uh, a, the spectrum broadening. And then uh, uh, if we change the mode, the, the broadening is different. And if we have different combinations, you know, this is the combination of the modes. So the point is, as we change this, the combination of spatial modes at the input, the spectrum changes. So the goal here is to use a neural network to select the modes to give you a desired spectral output. So the experiment, I guess, for those of you that saw my talk yesterday, is similar to uh, the setup we had yesterday, which was not accidental. <laughs> we did this first, by the way. So we have an SLM here, the, uh, the, where we write uh, the initial condition, which is selecting some of the modes to be launched, some combination of the mo spatial modes of the fiber to be launched. Then they propagate and give us some sort of speckle pattern, especially. But more importantly, for this case, we're looking at the spectral distribution. And the goal again is to shape the input and by the shape of the input, determine what the spectrum of the light is at the other end. And the way we're going to determine what the shape of the input should be is by using a neural network uh, uh, with uh, a database with examples obtained from the fiber itself. Uh, so yeah, so here's, uh, here's some results. Uh, so this is this is the spectrums that you get by uh, by combining different different uh, inputs. So uh, in this example, this the one is pretty dramatic. The the one on the left is what gives you the distribution here, the the dark one, and the one on the right, which is somewhat different, gives you a spectrum there. And then uh, this is more evident. The difference between this and this is this pattern here gives you this spectrum. <laughs> That's no Raman stuff. You never went out. Here it goes to 1350, right? The pump is 1030. So here we get all wavelengths all the way out here. And none of them with this input. And with this input, you get this spectrum. So the network is supposed to take a, uh, a desired spectral distribution at the output of the fiber. So if this is what we would like the spectrum of the light at the output of the fiber to be, uh, then we use this network to tell us which combination of uh, these uh, five modes we should put, we should, which superposition of the five modes we should record on the input SLM and then launch in the fiber so that after they propagate in the fiber, we get this spectrum at the output. And again, we use spectra obtained from the fiber itself with for different combinations of this to give us the training set. And here's the results. This was, uh, uh, by now it's, uh, it was in archives, now it appeared in an APL. Uh, and then, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's APL, I think it's, yeah, APL, I guess. So then uh, uh, this is the target spectrum and the red is the 
actual spectrum that was produced. So by launching some the proper spatial distribution and using this neural network approach, you can control the spectrum that you get out. Same thing for the different spectral bands. So this was for the band from 1000 to 1300. This is for where Raman kicks in. Okay, so now just to a different topic, same, same theme that we have an optical system uh, what I talked to you about so far was to uh, have a multi, the optical medium is not a lens, it's a multi-mode fiber, in which case the input to output relationship becomes very complex, becomes this transformation, in the mode domain, which looks like speculative output. But then we can use the, the computer, we can use uh, machine learning to undo, to reverse. In this case, I'll show you a little bit different uh, problem, which is to, uh, uh, to look at three-dimensional objects. It's still an imaging system, input-output, but th the goal is to, uh, to image a, a, an uh, object in the middle, which is three-dimensional. And because we have a two-dimensional detector, where uh, just like our eyes or CCDs, they're all two-dimensional sensors, we are constrained to look at 2D projections of the 3D world or, or any 3D uh, medium. So the goal of this next thing I'll talk to you about is to use neural networks somehow or neural network approaches uh, to uh, consider the 2D measurements that we make of 3D objects as examples that we will use to train a, a system to then reconstruct the 3D distribution. So you learn to interpret the 3D world from the 2D projections, which of course we do. You know, when I look around, everything is 3D and my, my retinas in my eyes are 2D, but that doesn't confuse me. I mean, I can, I can have 3D perception because of uh, cognition in that because I know, because when my head moves, the parallax thing moves, the two eyes and everything. There's a lot of cues we use to, to interpret the world in 3D. Uh, so the thing is to do the same thing in machines. And actually, this is probably a much more difficult problem than the problem we did before, which is to, from the measurements here, to build a network to tell us what was at the input. What would be the problem now would be to do the same thing from, we illuminate a 3D object, let's think of the multi-mode fiber now as a 3D object as opposed to a fiber that transmits information. In other words, it's three-dimensional index distribution and its shape and all that stuff. And we illuminate it multiple times and we have these 2D measurements of this 3D object. So the object would be to, from these measurements, to tell you what the shape of this fiber was. That is possible, if we were, I'll show you, but difficult. So the, the answer is tomography, it's called tomography, just like x-ray tomography, when you, if you want to look at your lungs these days, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, you know, the, the lungs are three-dimensional object and you look at 2D projections. So tomography, tomography you can fix that by having multiple angles of the projection or slicing or whatever, you get three dimensional. So in optics, uh, tomography is like this, you illuminate an object, in this case it's like a cell, there's a nucleus and, uh, and the uh, cytoplasm around it, and then as you illuminate at different angles, this thing shows that at different angles, you look at this part, the nucleus with respect to the other stuff changes slightly in position. And this slight change from different projections allows you to, to form a 3D reconstruction. What you see down here is experimental stuff, but this is what the optical setup looks like of a laser. Uh, part of the light from the laser gets split here and illuminates this 3D sample. So this uh, GM is sense for galvo mirror. This galvo mirror rotates, which this is a 4F system, changes the angle of illumination on the object. So as time goes by, as this rotates, uh, we illuminate different, different uh, angles, then the light that's transmitted and scattered by this object gets imaged with the 4F system onto the camera. There's a reference bit because we record the stuff holographically to, to, to record the scattered field both amplitude and phase. 
So what's shown here is a digital simulation of what light transmitted to this object at different angle looks like. So as I go at different angles, I, the transmission changes. You can see a little bit the what the, the light gets distorted differently because as uh, this has a certain three-dimensional index distribution, but light as it goes through it, it, uh, it gets scattered differently. And this is now experimental, uh, but the simulation will be very similar. Uh, what we observe on the, the phase we measure on the camera. So at different angles, you measure slightly different, the, the nuclei move with respect to the... So now how do we reconstruct... So if you think of this as examples to, to be used, so we'd like to go from this 2D measurements back to the 3D distribution, which caused the slide to diffract. So use beam propagation. Uh, so what we need is a, a model like this. So the idea is this, we'll have a model, which is the beam propagation model, model which also was used to create this animation. So the, the prediction by the model will be compared to the actual measurement, which will cause an error. Then this error we'll use to modify the values of the index of refraction that we used in the model to make the prediction. So if we have, we know if we somehow we have identified the true 3D index distribution of the object and our model, propagation model is uh, accurate enough, then we'll have a match between the measurement, experimental measurement and the prediction of the model. So in this approach, the neural network is not a conventional neural network. It's not a neural network that has weights. It's a neural network that somehow simulates the propagation, physical propagation through the sample. There's beam propagation, in other words, you take the three-dimensional distribution of the object, you slice it up into little prosciutto slices. So each one is uh, it's typically a few microns uh, in, in the computer, I mean. Then uh, as you propagate through it, you have to account for Fresnel diffraction because propagating through some distance delta Z, and then some phase modulation because of the index distribution in that particular slice. Then that is where you calculate how light propagates from the beginning of the slice to the end of the slice. But the end of one slice is the beginning of the next. And so you do the same, the same, the same. So you start, let's say, with a plane wave on the left and you end up with the light distribution on the right. So you end up with a plane wave on the left and the light distribution on the right by following. So this is, this is a, the, the, the digital rendering of propagating through this particular cell. So if you draw what I just told you as a diagram so that it looks like a network, you have the incident field, the plane wave. So this would be the complex values. You know, uh, For a plane wave, it would be all the same. AA. For a tilted plane wave, it would have e to the j, k, z, if tilted uh, framework. Then these nodes represent the um, modulation, the phase modulation at each slice with beam propagation. So each voxel uh, imprints a different phase delay on the beam. Then the, the dark uh, lines are not weights. They are the complex weights, or the complex linear transformation that describes Fresnel diffraction for one slice of the beam propagation. So these are fixed weights. Then this is the next slice, the phase modulation of the next slice and the Fresnel diffraction of that after that modulation, etc., etc., until you reach the output where the, in the experiment the, uh, the output is detected, amplitude and, and phase. So then you compare the two, compare the measurement and then the prediction of the model for what the, the field should be given our current assumption of what the, what the phase modulation should be. The phase modulation is given by the index of refraction. If they're too much, nothing to do, means we have guessed perfectly what the index of refraction is at its voxel, at its position, which means the corresponding phase change is the same. But if not, we'll have an error, and we'll also have error. And we use this error then to modify our current guess for what, for what the 3D distribution is. And we continue this until we, you know, either we run out of time or, run, or, or we, the error is too small. So here's the, uh, this is a movie, hopefully it plays, 
Uh, yeah, I should have checked first. So what we see here is the result. What we see here is the x y. In other words, what we see here is the image in. We we'll call this x y in the transverse planes of the detector, or x y here in the transverse planes, and z is along the direction of propagation. So this one here is a movie of the XY image of uh, of the model in one slice in the middle plane of the 3D object. And this is the X, X, uh, XZ and YZ images. And this shows what happens in the number of iterations. So you see the image gets sharper and sharper as we continue to iterate through the system. And in XZ as well, we, we have this well-known uh, missing comb problem. The elongation in the Z direction is also reduced. So in this case, we start with 80 projections. Then uh, you start iterating through the system and guessing what the 3D distribution of the index is. And as time goes by, you get, you get this. So this is what we did. This is our approach, the one I just showed you. This is the image that you get for a, it's a HeLa cell. Uh, and this is a, a next, the, the, the one before was, uh, was from uh, an earlier experiment. This is more recent experiments published in, in, in IEEE. The original paper was published in Optica. This was published in IEEE. You get better results if you include sparsity, const different constraints, digital signal processing tricks. You get the very nice images. If you use more traditional methods with the same 81 projections, Wolf is the standard method that's being used, the Ritov it's called sometimes. And this is Radon, which is a method that doesn't account for diffraction. So you can, so you can see diffraction artifacts and uh, also this one is not as good, but this one is, is better. Uh, now, why is it better? It's a good question, why is it better? Because in, in this approach, if, uh, if you made a perfect guess of what the incident field is, and if the BPM is accurate, which is very accurate for this low contrast, uh, uh, if, your, if your forward model is very accurate, then you'll get no error. So there is a delta phi you can look for that gives you zero error. Now it could be if the model is not accurate, that then this would not be true. But uh, but if the model, the forward model is accurate enough, then you, you can find the perfect reconstruction. Whereas these are direct inversion models and which are based on some approximations. This is ray optics, this is single scattering. So that, uh, that uh, is not. So one key thing that's better for beam propagation, beam propagation method can account for multiple scattering. So this is an experiment uh, showing, showing this effect. So you have, this is the this is the reconstruction as a function of time again, as we go through iterations. Uh, the bottom is learning tomography, and the top is the conventional rule for it of reconstruction. So, what we see here is three cylinders. When they're parallel to each other, then you have you have no problem, because they they somehow are image independent. Light that comes to one. It's scattered and goes to the detector and separately from the other one. But when they're lined up this way, light that comes from the one modifies the light after it, and then and then the uh, and then uh, something wrong here. And then the light that illuminates the second one is no longer a plane wave, as most models most models assume that the incident light assume the Born approximation that uh, the cylinders don't affect the light too much. Ah, yeah, there we go. So the difference is dramatic. Of course, here, because the conventional models assume that the incident plane wave, as it goes through the cylinders, it gets unaffected. But learning tomography, because of this beam propagation method, continuously updates the field as you propagate through, and the reconstruction is, is much better. Play it one more time. So the initial condition is always this, and then the iterations improve. 
Okay, so this this was on a kind of artificial example, but this is actually two yeast cells, two biological cells. But if we want to stack them one against the other, this is the conventional approach. And uh, you know the size is different, the shape is different, but but with this learning approach, you get you get much better. And this is a 3D rendering of the same thing. This is a bigger cluster of cells, again, yeast cells. So, and here is the version using learning. So you can definitely identify individual cells in their clusters. And this is a, a cochlea, where you see different elements of the cochlea, and it's ganglion cells and, and the rotated version. Okay, so uh, uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And then uh, uh, these are the people that worked on this. There's, there's quite a few. Uh, I should say that a lot of this work is in collaboration with Christoph Moser, who has uh, worked on most of the work on multimode fibers. And Professor Unzer here at EPFL, uh, who, with whom I collaborated on the tomography project. And the old work was uh, together with Professor Nabil Farhat, uh, from uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania. So that's the end of my talk. So uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'll be happy to. Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Uh, always a uh, very clear, uh, very beautiful talk. Very easy to follow, I believe, for students. And uh, I open here the panel uh, with questions. Which was okay. the uh, Stefano Martina. Stefano Martina, how big was the speckle pattern that I said? Uh, I think you're talking about the multimode fiber, right? Correct, Marti uh, Stefano. Well, uh, I should activate him for speaking. Just a moment. Stefano, can you hear us? Uh, hello? Yes. Hello. yes. Hello, Stefano. Um, thank you. You asked, you asked about the size of the training set, I assume, for this experiment, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think this was 20,000. 20, 10 classes, so 2,000 per class. Okay. And I forget exactly, but probably 900 to 100 for training and test. Okay, thank you. And we have Lorenzo Patelli. Ciao Lorenzo, did I understand correctly uh, that the early phase recognition application will perform using incoherent light while the later example... Uh, can you read aloud so maybe yeah. people can hear? Yeah, let me, let me summarize because are there are only performance difference between it. Okay, so the question is whether the early experiment with young moving, the, the phase recognition, whether that was done with incoherent light. No, the answer no, that, that was done also with coherent light because um, uh, the uh, the weights were implemented and stored in a volume hologram. So that was the big advantage of that architecture, that you could have a lot of storage density, you have a big network of you know, billion weights at that time. And so that for recording and reading out the hologram, you need coherence. Now you wouldn't need much coherence to read it out. You would need some special coherence, like with an LED nowadays, you could read it out. But uh, uh, it wasn't, it was done with a laser. The later experiments, very correctly you, you point out, uh, you know, with the fiber, reconstructing the images through the fiber were done with the laser because if you do the same thing, what I'm showing here, this, what's showing right now on the screen with the speckle pattern of light going through the fiber, if we use an LED, let's say, uh, we would have to filter it a little bit spectrally to start seeing speckle. So with white light, you would just see a big white blob. You wouldn't see any structure. So it's the interference between the different modes being delayed by different amounts that gives the structure. And then this structure then is affected 
by the shape of the input pattern that you project into the fiber. So in order to be able to project, to reconstruct that shape, you need to be able to, to detect something that has some spatial information. And for that, you need the coherent map. Does that answer your question? It's Lorenzo Patelli, right? Okay, Lorenzo, you can... Uh... See? Yes. Yes, yes, thanks. Please answer, answer my question. The next question is from uh, Mario Ferraro. Thanks for the interest of this. I wonder why you chose the LG40 mod. Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Eh? The most mod is not modulated with the parameters. Okay, so uh, this is very, very, very. <laughs> I'm glad. Th thank you for noticing. So we picked one, or selected in the experiment, we'll try to control the spectrum of the fiber by, by using the neural network and the, and the spatial shape at the input. Uh, we picked one mode to act as kind of a, by analogy to holography, it would be like a reference beam. And then the other would be the, the signal beam because you need to create a spectrum and you need to have uh, the LG40, uh, it has a, had this has a strong uniform shape and of course this will be coupled and change as it goes through the multi-mode fiber but it provides a baseline and when it mixes it mixes with the other modes then it gives it gives the uh, background so if you remove that the, if you remove the lg40 then the effects are not as predictable and lg40 was more powerful more stronger than the rest in other words you have a strong lg40 and then five other modes that whose amplitude is modulated and the combination of those determines the spectrum. If we just put the five ones, uh, it's, it's less, less, uh, less controllable. So having a, a strong mode to mix with the, with the ones that we are modulated uh, seems to provide a better uh, platform for, for controlling the spectrum of the output. Okay, but can can you hear me? Yeah, I guess. Okay, just uh, uh, okay. I understand this, but uh, is there a reason for specifically choosing the LG forty or you for zero? Or you can choose another one, like an LP zero one, LP one one. Yeah, you can choose another one, but I think this was uh, actually I'm not a hundred percent sure to be honest why we chose this particular one. Uh, the person that did this experiment is Ugo Tejin, who's a very entrepreneurial, very good student. But I think he did it because it probably uh, has a good overlap with the rest of the modes. Because you'd like it to have a good inner product with the other modes that you're controlling. And you just want to make it stronger so that uh, provides a, you know. Uh, so if, uh, and perhaps you don't want it to be part of the same family of modes so that it doesn't, it doesn't sort of, uh, interact with other modes that are not being controlled by the network. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? Uh, yes. Stefano Martina, I think, uh, suggests yes. Diego. Ah, Diego, the next one is Diego. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to know if in addition to image classification, it's possible to carry out other computer vision by an example, object detection. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Diego. Well, part of the, I think I answered part of your question in, uh, in my talk. I mean, you did both things. You could take the digits at the input and, uh, and uh, reconstruct them. And then actually it's here, the talk. Uh, and then also, uh, classify them. So this is a classification task and the other is a recognition task. Now, this is a good point because let's say we're gonna use this for endoscopy. One thing that uh, somebody else has done, not us actually since after our work, uh, instead of trying to reconstruct an image of what you see inside, let's say you're looking for, you're looking for a particular type of cell, you, you insert the, uh, the, end, uh, the endoscope and then you can have the network tell you what, what part of the body you are. are you, this is a liver cell, this is a blood cell, what it is you're looking at as opposed to reconstructing the image to be interpreted after, uh, after it's been detected. Uh, 
Yeah, so the answer is you, you can classify or reconstruct. It turns out that reconstruction is a little bit easier, at least the way we did it. Uh, it's easier as measured by, let's say, mean squared error. Because you can think of reconstruction, let's say you have a thousand, well, 10,000 pixel image, and you reconstruct it with 10,000 pixel reconstructions. It's like having 10,000 chances for classifying the image. You can think of each pixel of the reconstruction saying, if it's a binary image, it is a high or a low, depending on what the input was. So you have 10,000 chances for doing the reconstruction. And then when you evaluate the image quality by mean squared error, you average the errors. Whereas you classify the image, one image, is it a nine or not a nine? Uh, then if you make 10% uh, errors, that seems like a bad thing. But if you make 10% errors in an image of 10,000 images and you look at it, you know, it's, it's uh, less forgiving. So this was the point of this thing here, that if you first reconstruct and then binarize the image and then, and then classify it, you get better. Did you answer your question? Ah, Lorenzo. Okay, so I guess this brings us to the end of our, eh? it's also 11. Yes, right. We are just on, uh, on time for the virtual coffee <laughs> machine. <laughs> and uh, thanks. Thanks a lot again for your contribution. It was excellent and uh, very nice to see you. Thank you, Stefano. Very hope nice to, to see you. Yes, hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, yeah we should definitely maybe Zoom soon. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Bye. So we we'll see Bye. each other. We we'll see each other in half an hour. Yes.